Topping Talks. Hundred and five hours a week, can't be beat. Welcome to Topping Talks. Topping Talks is a Topping Tribune production, and today's episode is probably sponsored by Topping Technologies and ExpressVPN. Topping Talks is also on Spotify, Google Podcast, Apple Podcast, and Stitcher. Topping Technologies is an IT value-added resource and services company with a special proficiency in security. Heck, I see their founder at least twice a day, have to say. Quite handsome and brilliant. If you're a business in Texas that could use a hand, you can reach us at sales at toppingtechnologies.com. Also, are you part of the 3.6% of Americans who still care about privacy? If you are, then perfect. ExpressVPN can assist. Even though 96% of stats are made up on the spot, ExpressVPN does give 100% guarantee via their 30-day money-back guarantee. Now, without further ado, I'm proud to say today I'm interviewing Derek Haidari, who is a senior product develop engineer at Toyota North America. Hey. Derek, thanks so much for coming on the show, man. Appreciate oh, it. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it being here. So I know it's going winding back the clock a couple of years, but how do you first get into cars or what first inspired you to get into the whole hobby? Uh, well, I think it all started when I was really young. Um, my father had uh, a bunch of friends that had cars, and, and I remember my very first car to ever ever drive myself, and I was I think I was maybe eight or ten, was a, uh, a, a 70s Stingray Corvette. No way. Oh, yeah, it was fantastic. It, you know, sat in there in the parking lot, and that's what we used to do. We used to go teach me to drive. You could drive around in a parking lot. And, and one of the first cars that he did that in was a buddy of his, his Corvette. And uh, uh, it, it just stuck with me. And from there, little by little, you know, I had many other interests and hobbies before cars, but that's always been in the back of my mind. And then uh, when I got my first car, uh, I started tinkering with it. And that's kind of, that's me. I'm, I'm a tinkerer. And, and uh, it just translated into doing things with cars and it just felt right. It always felt right. So from that point uh, on, uh, my first Toyota was a uh, was a Forerunner. My first car was a Forerunner. Oh, and, nice. Um, I uh, uh, did a little modifications here and there, stereo equipment, oh, yeah. suspension, all that kind of good stuff. And from that in, that moment on, it's just been it's been in my life. It never went away. So do you go off roading, or what do you like to do with it? I did go off roading. Yeah. <laughs> um, got some stories there. Uh, probably off roading where I shouldn't have. That's <laughs> <laughs> over seven years ago, right? Statue oh, of yeah, I was sixteen. I was. Oh, there you uh, go. Yeah. Long, long, long time ago. <laughs> I'm sure uh, <laughs> statute of limitations is long gone by now. Um, yeah, off roading, uh, but but mostly it was just a platform for me to experiment with, and and uh, um, like I said, I did uh, did stereo equipment. My first uh, modification was putting you know big you know dual twelve inch subs in oh, the yeah. rear and. And figuring out how to do all that, I st- stayed up real late, you know, at night, uh, after school nights and whatnot, whatnot uh, mm-hmm. developing uh, switch boxes. Oh, and, really? And yeah, just just coming up with, you know, did, did the whole lights thing before it was super popular. You know, this oh, was cool. pre Fast and the Furious kind of deal. So oh, yeah. I had neons on the car. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. You got the gr- uh, the green glow. Uh, it was red, so I did a oh, lot. Of, okay. I did a lot of red. <laughs> I did a lot of red and blue actually. So probably. Again, <laughs> not appropriate for uh, uh, for the laws that are out there, but um, you know, a long time ago. But yeah, I yeah, had a lot of fun with that. Oh, that's awesome. That's so much fun tinkering with your first car. That could, it's also a r- little bit of a rabbit hole because mm-hmm. it's basically unlimited things you could upgrade on any vehicle. <laughs> well, that's the beauty of cars, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, there's a lot of hobbies out there that, that you know, cater to a certain person mm-hmm. or a certain personality or whatever have you. Cars caters to everyone. Oh, yeah. There's not a single person that can't get some enjoyment or use out of a car, right? Absolutely. So as a hobby, you could be off-roaders. You could be yeah. race car drivers. You could be uh, show car aficionados. You, right. could, you could just enjoy the drive. I mean, oh, yeah. getting from point to A to point B can be a hobby in itself. Traveling, you know, all that kind of good stuff. So it's, it's yeah, there's something for everyone in them. Oh, absolutely. I, yeah. I know a couple of my friends are in field sales. They kind of hate driving somewhere. But to me, I love windshield. You know, you call it windshield time. It's mm. there's something therapeutic about, you know, going between meetings, driving a couple towns over, shifting through the gears. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah listening to music yeah, on exactly. a crisp day. You yeah. know, not too cold, which just a little bit crispy with the wind down. And yeah. listening to your favorite song, driving on the highway with no destination in mind. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's a, that's a therapy. You know, that's therapy right there. Then what was your first role, or what did you first uh, go to school for engineering, or uh, getting into cars, oh, or no, what, what, no, what, no. how did the official path go? Or? <laughs> that path is a crazy one. Um, so at, outside of high school, um, did you know a bunch of odd and end jobs. Uh, I used to work on on towers. Uh, oh, cell towers? Cell cell phone tires, towers. We used to build them over for a company that my uncle owned. 
Cool. Uh, so we go and build them, climb them. You know, been I've been oh, as high man. as a thousand feet in the air, you really know, looking down with a rope attached to me, and that's about it. Oh my gosh! <laughs> yeah. How scary was that? Or do you, you just terrifying? So, absolutely terrifying. Um, so what were you doing, climbing up all the way to the tower, or going all the way up? Are you bolting it and erecting it and building it as you're going up, or what was the process like? Uh, well, so you know. Uh, the process can can vary depending on the type of, of, of tower, obviously, you know, but, uh, you know, we'd, we'd get we'd get uh, cranes and stuff to help us out. And then, you know, we built the the frame, the foundation together with, you know, bolts. We'd climb up the sides of them and, and attach them together and put the next section on the next section on. And then, you know, once it was all done, you had to put the antennas on and route the cabling and put oh, it yeah. in, the, in the control box or in the control room and all this kind of good stuff. So it's it's it was it was pretty intense. Um, you know, I, I was still new when yeah. we were building them. So, you know, we, we even had it to where, uh, I, I would, I would ride on the crane with the antennas, mm -hmm. you know, I would be attached to the antenna and they'd put me on it and they'd put raise the whole thing. Oh my gosh. I don't know if you're supposed to do that. <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't know if OSHA is going to find them or now, but I won't <laughs> no. say the name of the company, but, um, you know, that's just kind of what it is. It was a bunch of the, us, you know, tower hands would yeah. just do whatever it took to get the job done. So, uh, some scary stuff. I, I can safely say I, I'm I'm glad I'm where I'm at now, and I don't want to go back. <laughs> oh, absolutely. That, yeah. Those videos are also there's a like there's a whole documentary on like you know top obscure and highest paying jobs in America. Yeah. And some of them were the people whose job is to physically climb to the tower or, or top of those towers and change like a light bulb on oh, some yeah. of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you look at the videos and you're like, oh my gosh, it's yeah, it's that's terrifying. Scary. Yeah, it's terrifying. <laughs> and 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 the the even though you've got safety equipment there, it's not exactly comfortable. Well, I mean, there are some times when maybe you have to disconnect both of your safety lines to get to the point to put your safety line on and, and, you know, you're not supposed to, or, you know, yeah. maybe, maybe there's uh, something that you can't, like I said, tower hands do what they need to do. Oh, but, yeah. but I mean, in all honesty, it, it, it's terrifying, you know, and, and, you know, I'm afraid of heights. And you still did it? I said, well, I had to. Oh my God. That's, <laughs> that's a definite, that's, that's a, a drive, definition right? of courage. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so I did that for a little while. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, it helped fund my college fund mm -hmm. right uh and the first thing i actually wanted to do so surprisingly was uh digital media oh really i was big into 3d modeling uh oh, yeah. I, I i did some development work from beta video games where um it, it was a long long time ago very yeah. very long time ago i don't know if you've heard of uh counter-strike of course that, that was back, one of the most popular first person shooters in history yeah 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 back when it was beta before valve took it over or before whoever owns it now it, it was a it was a mod for the half-life game right like yeah. it was a free yeah i remember so i was in that community of of people that would help develop the the guns and the the skins and all that kind of good stuff for it back when i was in you know high school kind of deal and there was a bunch of people that would submit their their guns and, and the main guy would would select some and not you know reject others and would help put his own stuff in it but anyway so uh i had i had made the um mp5 oh really and it was used for one of the versions that's awesome yeah yeah and a friend of mine skinned it and so you know i I've, i had a lot of fun doing that stuff um I did i did i did another bunch of models for a paintball uh game also through half-life yeah. it was a half-life mod i forget the paintball game um, but I did a couple of paintball guns and stuff like that. So, you know, just had fun with the 3D modeling and uh, decided I, you know, was going to go to go to school or try to put myself yeah. to school to do that, and uh, um, learned Photoshop and did this other stuff. And then um, one of my teachers, uh, you know, was describing the actual job that we would get into, mm -hmm. and his words were, you know. If you like being creative, this isn't for you. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> it's basically if, it, you know, if you need to be able to do things uh, that you may not like. Yeah. Because, you know, you're you're paid to do someone else's vision, right? So, right. Uh, and that didn't, I didn't really, I mean, eh. It sounds exciting. Eh, stop. It, it lost its luster. Yeah. Um, and so I, I ended up coming back to, to that. that was all in Austin. And I ended up coming back in Dallas, coming back to Dallas to uh, uh, help my dad work in his his restaurant business for a while, and then uh, saved up again to start going back to college. Where um, during that time I was working with uh, uh, at, at my dad's places, um, I developed, you know, I remembered, I guess I should say, that I love cars, and so yeah. I had at the time, uh, <laughs> I was one of those Honda Honda boys where right. I had a. Yeah. I had a, I had a <laughs> You know, you, you're like, you, you oh, had yeah. the city, you know, all of that. So I had an Accord, <laughs> nice. um, the 2001, uh, two door. So, um, you know, I, I 
modified it, did the whole show car thing. What, and what drive did, drivetrain did you have? You have four bangers? In I had, I actually had two. I had two Accords. I so I had one of each. <laughs> I, had there you a, go. Uh, I had the automatic V6, and then I yep. had the uh, a five speed uh, four banger. It was, nice. the, I guess it's the F. And if I'm wrong, I'm sorry, but I think it was the F24A block mm-hmm. um, on the four cylinder, which, you know, was um, 2.4 liter VTEC, you know, that kind of stuff. Oh, yeah. Five speed. It was, you know, it was, it was fun. It was oh, fun. Yeah. It was a heavy car. It was never going to be super fast, but it was oh, yeah. fun to modify. It was just, it was, it was a gorgeous car. I thought it, you know, looked, looked absolutely stunning. So, you know, the whole time I'm doing that, I'm of course pouring my college fund into that car. Yeah. Um, but uh, eventually I, I decided, you know, why, why am I not? learning more about how I do my own old changes. I do my own car. Yeah. I make my own things. Why not, you know, become a tech? Uh, that's yeah. seemed like a logical choice for me. So, uh, that's when I went to, uh, um, uh, started, started, a, a, an automotive program and, and, uh, um, at a, at a community college, mm-hmm. uh, and, uh, kind of started doing that and, and, uh, got a job real quick with a local dealership, oh, nice. um, and worked with them for 10 years. I met my wife, uh, in those automotive classes. Oh, there you go. Um, she, uh, she, <laughs> we, we, the, the, the automotive classes, you'd have a classroom part and then you'd have a shop part. Yeah. And although for a while we were never in the same class and, and, you know, me being a complete introvert in it, when it comes to that stuff, never really saw the signs of her, her flirting. And when we were in the shop, Oh, really? uh, but yeah, she, she absolutely came on to me. Like there was no, I wasn't looking, in, in other words. And uh, I remember when we finally did get a class together, and, and the, the first part will come, I'll, I'll explain why I mentioned that earlier. When we first got into class together, um, you know, we would, I would, I had, had one of those Motorola Razor phones back oh, in yeah. the day. I don't know if you remember. Oh, yeah, the, flip, the original flip yeah, phone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not the original, but the yeah, iconic flip had phone. One. Yeah. Everyone had one. Uh, so I was so proud of mine. Yeah. I mean, I, I bought it, you know, like I said, spent, you know, saved up all my money and, and oh, yeah. so proud of this phone. And it had internet, kind of. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and yeah. and uh, <laughs> I remember her asking, you know, oh, that's a really cool phone. Can I see it? And I was showing her all these different things. And it started off where I would, I would give her a joke of the day. Yeah. Because it would, it would be one of those stupid websites, you know, that didn't yeah. have any content. It was like, hey, here's a joke of the day. And so you yeah. click on it. And I would, every day I would give her a joke of the day. And then it turned into pickup lines. It was the pickup yeah. line of the day. And, you know, again, oblivious me. Um, what, one day, uh, um, you know, she keeps asking about it, she keeps asking about it, and she just takes my phone and says, you know, I'm just going to take this. I, I like your phone too much. I'm going to take it. And I was like, ha, 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 funny. <laughs> no, she, she, she left. She left <laughs> the class, and I didn't have my phone, and, and I was like, okay, well, <laughs> um, I, you really just stole my phone. <laughs> <laughs> so I ended up going back home that day and, and calling my own cell phone. And, and, uh, from your landline? Yeah, from yeah. my landline, because we had those yeah, back then. Back yeah, back the day. Yeah, we don't have them Plug now, in the wall. We? Yeah, I had my own phone, so I, I called her from my landline, and <laughs> And uh, politely asked if I could get my phone back. And she said, yeah, but you got to take me to dinner. <laughs> and at that moment, I was like, I'm a moron. Of course. that's <laughs> that's So you had to do something drastic to get my attention. Yeah. So anyway, ended up uh, uh, getting my phone back. And, and her, her uh, uh, hilarious story was she always tried to get my attention in the shop because she would always come over to the shop and ask me questions, even though we were not in the same class. Yeah. You know, hey, how do I do this? How do I do this? And, you know. To me, it was it was just someone asking for help because it yeah. happened a lot. Um, yeah. And uh, uh, yeah, she was like, "No, that was just I was just trying to get you to engage <laughs> with me, man. Come on." <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, that's how that's how I met my wife. We've been married now for um, I think thirteen years. Oh so. wow! Congrats. Yeah. That that's one of my favorite intro stories or get together stories. Yeah, yeah. That is, that is so cool. A mixture of technology and love and pain. That's incredible. <laughs> exactly. what, like, what are the odds? <laughs> yeah, no, I, I feel f- I'm lucky, man. That's what it is. I'm just just a lucky guy. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And then kind of going after that story, do you care or can you expand on the marriage? Because that was a really unique experience. Oh, yes. Yes, the marriage. Um, so, as you can imagine, my wife also likes cars. Oh, yeah. Uh, she was in the class for automotive technology, the same as me. Uh, she worked for Lexus. I worked for Toyota when we first got out of, out of the out of the. Uh, the school and uh, when we decided to finally get married, because we I think we took a five year you know uh, mm-hmm. court trial. Oh, I'm yeah. gonna call it a trial. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, we decided, you know, hey, let's let's do something special that we both like. And at the time, <clears throat> I actually um, got my first uh, vintage Skyline, if you will. Um, I had an R33, and so I was very proud of it. My wife is actually the one that helped you know, usher it in and, nice. and, and everything. And we found it. And, um, 
it was a GTST, it was blah, blah, blah. But we wanted to kind of incorporate our passion for cars. Mm -hmm. And so we found a venue that's actually no longer in existence. It's if it's a, uh, it's in Richardson. Um, if you're local listening, it's a uh, K one speed yeah. uh, in Richardson. It used to be a uh, uh, car consignment museum and event center. Really? And they basically had all kinds of vintage cars that, you know, you know, high end cars that people would put on consignment. So they'd put a display out there with the history of the car and what it was and, you know, all this different stuff. And you'd go in as a museum, you'd pay $5 and go walk around. And, and, yeah. you know, if you liked the car, you could contact the person and buy it. I mean, yeah, you know, good idea. Yeah. So it was pretty neat, but they also had a venue center. So we ended up having our wedding there and we had my car. We had, uh, I think you're a guest on your show or oh, yeah. a previous David Chuckman, his car was actually in, in my wedding. Oh yeah. Um, his GTR was and, and several other, uh, GTRs and, and my wife had a 300 ZX that was in it. Oh, nice. Um, so yeah, we we had several people in the in the the ceremony. There was a row of our cars. I had a turntable that had the st the my car on it that was you know displaying the 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 groom's car and um, oh, cool. the reception had it all there. And and it got wind. Uh, it made it out in the public. And and Jalopnik did a did a story on it. So, oh really? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. What was the story about? Was that the? It, it was basically a just that there was a skyline wedding. Yeah. I mean, you know, That's um, so cool. it was a neat little deal where, uh, uh they had, uh, uh, pictures of all the cars and yeah. all that kind of good stuff. And it was, it was, it was a fantastic, fantastic, uh, wedding, I think so. That's legendary. I mean, that's, that's one of the most unique weddings I've ever heard about. That's awesome. I can't say we're the only ones to have yeah. done that. Uh, there's been a couple others since then, but I, Kind of think we might be the first. I don't know. Maybe, maybe trendsetter. Maybe, <laughs> maybe because I, I have seen some other skyline weddings in the past, but I I want to say that they were all younger than me. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. So, and then it is. what was it like working at the first? I think you said your first official job in automotive was that at the Toyota dealership. It was a local Toyota dealership. Yep. Um, honestly, it was one of the best experiences. Uh, you know, coming out of being finding out who I wanted to to eventually get into. Mm -hmm. um, I work, one thing about the cars, the car industry and, and, and just cars in general, I think we talked about it earlier, was um, the diverse crowd that cars bring, right? Everybody, oh, yeah. everybody's involved with cars. There's nothing cars don't touch, right? Exactly. And so that's afforded me some wonderful people to work with. Not only, um, you know, are the people that I work with just passionate about cars, they're intelligent, they're smart, um, some of them are the exact opposite. So sure. I've worked with all walks of life at this dealership. So the experience was was absolutely awesome. Um, but it's backbreaking work, man. Oh yeah, it, it is. It, you 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 work with uh, with flat rate. You know, you've got to have accuracy. You know, not only am I working for Toyota, which is yeah. known for you know durability and, and oh yeah. Um, you know, partial of that is is the responsibility of the text to maintain things accurately, uh, appropriately, and you know efficiently. Oh, so. Yeah. Um, I can't speak for all dealerships. I've only ever worked at Toyotas, but you know we take very big pride in in hitting all those goals. You know, training all the time and um, making sure that uh, you know we we use torque wrenches. Oh yeah, <laughs> <laughs> not everyone I know does, but we do. And so you know, it's kind of those thing that thing where um, it, it did give me a good exposure into into the car world, and and uh, uh, I had a lot of a lot of good times, and and was pretty successful at it. I think so, and. Uh, as soon as I uh, felt like, you know, I'd, I'd learned um, enough for me to move on to my next step, that's that's why I got into engineering was, you know, I wanted to help foster that same sentiment of, of building and continuing to, to have durable cars uh, to go into my engineering degree and um, start working for Toyota. That's, that's awesome. What was, how hard or what was that process like to... to move on or get promoted from dealership to the actual company. Because when I worked, I used to work at a car dealership and a lot of the guys there, that was kind of the dream is to get to work on the machines themselves. And there's that somewhat traditional path where you do work at a dealership for a while, and then you would apply to the parent company or, you know, the actual manufacturer behind it. And sometimes it's really hard. Yeah. You know, it's, it's funny you say that. I, I don't really, I don't think that's, I didn't see a lot of that. Uh, I, I wouldn't call what, what I did a promotion. It was yeah. more of a career shift. Cause it is, I guess for people that, unaware it is a franchise model so they're all in, it's an individual business so yeah, you know, every dealership is a franchise and then you have the yep. actual manufacturer so they're separate so, entities so they're actually thrice removed if you want to be technical so oh, with the disty 
there the distribution? Is, there's a distribution yeah. center like GST or SET that mm -hmm. actually buys the vehicles from the manufacturer and distributes them to the franchises that you're talking about. Oh, so, yeah. so there's, there's some layers, there's some layers in there. Um, but yeah, in, in general, uh, you know, the promotion usually that you get from a dealership is you go into you're working on the cars, maybe you'll become go into the sales path and go into the service advisor and then the service manager, yeah. or you'll go into the parts side and become parts manager. And, yeah. and, you know, ultimately it always tends to end up in sales because yeah. let's face it, that's what drives dealerships, right? Oh, yeah. So, um, I, I'm not much of a salesman. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm, I'm more of a, of a creator when it comes to tinkering and things like that. So my, my career shift, which is not uncommon, it, it isn't. I don't, yeah. let, me, let me be clear about that. But, you know, you don't see a whole lot of that. Um, yeah. I think most people that I worked with, you know, they became master techs and, and yeah. shop foremans. And, and right. you know, they're, they're so wildly successful in that. Oh, yeah. And, you know, being able to, to, to continue to maintain these, these vehicles and diagnose. I mean, diagnostics was... That was that was fun. That oh, was yeah. an absolute blast. It was hard. It's but like it was a, fun. It's like a puzzle. It's yeah, like always yeah. changing too. Yeah. And and every and every, every time is different. You know, yeah. you do enough of them, you'll see some repeat things. So you can yeah. diagnose things. You know, quick and quick fast. But you know, that's the whole point of flat rate, right? And but out of um, curiosity, what was the highest mileage Toyota you ever saw when you were in the when you were working in the service? Probably one that I owned. <laughs> oh really? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, we had a shop car that got kind of got passed around over the generations and. Uh, uh, it was a Camry, so it had a 90, 95 or 96 Camry. Mm -hmm. um, and when I finally purchased it, it had like 380,000 miles on it. 380? 380,000. It was bought at that oh dealership. My gosh. Really? One of, the, one of the the veteran techs bought it from the... the bought, it, bought it new. No, no, no. Uh, 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 I think it was a, a lady bought it. Yeah. Um, and, you know, she had it for 100,000, 150,000 miles. And yeah. And they went to go trade it in. And th this actually happens a lot. Techs will find a car yeah. that they, you know, either really like or notice that it's really pristine. And they'll go in oh, yeah. and, and offer to buy the car either straight from the sales manager or maybe sometimes from the, oh, yeah. <laughs> the owner itself. And so I don't know the whole story, but someone someone bought that car. Um, and one of the techs bought that car. And it kind of just became their car. They had it for a couple of years. They sold it to another tech. And then they sold it to another tech. Um, by the time I got it, it was, it was 380,000 miles, um, drove it, a uh, wife drove it, you know, just, it just, it just, you know, didn't have to do much to it. And then by the time I sold it, uh, I was getting into the, my school career and I needed to have, uh, an additional, we, we wanted to be, have new, a new car because I didn't have time to work on, make sure cars were, were maintaining and yeah, 380,000 miles. I think That's at the time enough. it was 480,000 miles. Uh, you know, if, 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 if I needed a new transmission, would I be able to afford it? I don't yeah. know. So uh, we sold it um, to uh, a local person. It wasn't a tech. No, no tech wanted it at that time. Um, but uh, I sold it to a, a, a local a local person who um, I asked him to, to keep in touch with me mm -hmm. and to let me know, you know, just yeah. tell me what the mileage is every, every now and again. And the last time, uh, last time I talked to him, um, it was less than, it was right under 600,000 miles. 600? Yeah. Holy and and happy to report that he didn't have any issues with it. Not since he had it when I sold it, but it was within the two hundred thousand miles that he had it, and, and it was apparently a work tr work car at the time too. So that's incredible. Yeah, yeah, you can't beat that reliability. That's the amount of engineering that has to go into that, all those components just to make it run that long is. Yeah, it's a process. Impressive to say the least. It's an impressive <laughs> process. Get, getting into to seeing how it's done now on the engineering side, it's it's impressive. It's impressive. A lot of effort. Oh yeah. So what was it like your first day getting the job at to at uh, Toyota? Of North America. Oh, man. <laughs> One of the most exciting days of my life. So coming into this, you know, I actually, um, before I get into that, oh, yeah. let, let me build into that story just so you can see, so, you, so I can express the awe that I actually felt. That sounds great. Um, so out of, out of the technicianing days, I've had to go back to college, mm -hmm. right, to get an engineering degree. Um, yeah. You tend to need one of those. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it helps. Uh, so I, I go in and, and, you know, spent the next actually five years of my life, uh, just in utter chaos. Engineering degrees are, they're, they're tough. They, they, they test you. They what test kind of you. mechanical electrical, or electrical, electrical okay. engineering? Yeah. Uh, they test you, they, they put you through the ringer. There's a lot of weed out classes that you got to endure. And, and, you know, I think I started off, um, my study group was probably, you know, 15, 20 people long. And, and I think we graduated with recognizing three. Oh wow. <laughs> yeah. It they weed them out. <laughs> they weed them out pretty good. So, um, 
so, you know, after finally getting through that struggle and, and maintaining the degree, it was so very proud to get, um, uh, during right the year before my graduation, um, the move, uh, from the accessory department, which I now work for mm-hmm. was in was in Torrance, California. All right. Um, and they were doing some recruiting because they knew they were building up, uh, that the, the campus now here in Plano. Yep. Um, they did some recruiting and, and, you know, they offered me the position to go <coughs> do an, an, an internship in the California one end. But, you know, at that time I had a family, um, yeah. I'd already had a 10 year career before I even went to school. Yeah. So, um, I was the old guy, <laughs> yeah. the guy in the room. Um, so, you know, they, they, they ended up offering me the internship and I turned it down and then, um, they called me back like maybe I say six months before I graduated and said, Hey, we we're now doing the internships in, uh, in Plano. We have yeah. a, an offsite campus. The, the campus is still being built up. There's another reserve area. We'd like for you to start doing the internship there. As soon as you graduate, you know, come start. So I actually, while going to school, did not think I was going to go back to work for, to, for a, for Toyota period. Mm-hmm. I, I, I got in electrical engineering cause I thought it was a variety, uh, or it was, it was a, it was a, a, a high demand engineering discipline. Mm-hmm. TI is around, around oh, the yeah. corner. Big Texas on, Instruments. Texas yeah. Instruments. So, you know, the, all these different places that, that you know, I was thinking about going into. Mm-hmm. Uh, just so happens that Toyota is like, hey, we could use you. Yeah. You come <laughs> and I was just like, I, you, you'll you never believe this, Toyota, but I worked for, you know, your dealerships for 10 years. This sounds yeah. like a like a perfect a match. match made in heaven. Yeah. yeah. So uh, first day of orientation, to answer your question, I, I'm already, you know, just super stoked because the Toyota, my first car. Yeah. My first career. And now I'm going into it on my first as an, as an engineer. So Toyota has just been, been my life. Right. Yeah. So I go into, walk into the, into the uh, lobby of the big headquarters for my first day of orientation. And there sat a 2000 GT pristine. Oh my gosh. White, beautiful as can be just sitting there in the lobby and just no one caring. You know, what? I walk in there and I'm just, Oh my gosh. Does everyone not see this? <laughs> it's a piece of artwork. <laughs> this artwork I mean, work over here for folks who don't realize that was one of the, the peak pieces of Toyota engineering was their first venture into the sports car category. Mm-hmm. And it was so beautifully designed. It, it was revolutionary. No one saw it coming. I yeah. mean, no, it, it changed the face of it. It, it actually paved the way for the Supra you see now. Yeah. Um, and, and, and Supra is the lineage, you know, it was, of course. it's not the technically the first Supra it's, it's still the 2000 GT, oh, but, yeah. but it is, it is the, the, the foundation foundation yeah. in which, you know, the, the popular sports cars of Toyota was founded on. And, yeah. and, 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 and oddly enough, uh, I don't know if you know this little, little bit of a tip uh, or a, a, a nugget of fact here is that it was actually kind of a joint venture with Yamaha too. I don't know. If oh, you, really? Yeah, I didn't know that. Yeah, Yamaha did, did a lot of, a lot of work with that. It was, it, it's pretty interesting that history. If, if you don't know the history of that car, um, it, it's it's exciting. If you're into cars at all, yeah. it's it's one of you know it, it rivals history like the like the GT40 does. I mean, it's oh, really? it's got a rich development story that I think you know most people find entertaining. But that's that's the that was a car that I I saw at my orientation and just knew that I was at home. <laughs> yeah, day day one, you see yeah. one of the most beautiful cars in history ever yeah. engineered. Yeah, and and we own Toyota. I think owns two. Oh, really? In our museum, we have a red one and a white one. And I remember the second time I ever saw a 2000 GT, I was walking into what uh, and in kind of our our uh, garage area. We have mm-hmm. a a big large shop uh, um, uh, next to next to where we do a lot of our development, our labs, and mm-hmm. things like that. And there was a bay door open to where we have a we have a, a kind of an on on site service garage where yeah. you know. If you have a Toyota lease vehicle, whatever, you can go and get serviced. You know, they're yeah. basically take care of the fleets. <laughs> We're walking down the, the long industrial hall. It's not it's not pretty like the other parts of the of yeah. the Toyota facility. You walk in on this looking through a garage door and there's a red two thousand GT just sitting there. Oh my gosh. Out of just just off in the corner, like <laughs> Like it's, you know, a, a, like it's a Corolla. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> so it was, um, it was, it's quite awesome whenever you see cars like that. And they, and they, you know, Toyota has, has a big museum full of these, these, these cars that they circle through, they circulate mm-hmm. throughout the uh, campus. So, you know, every day I, I go into the office, you see something new or, you know, part of Toyota history and it reminds you how, how right. awesome the, you know, the car world is and Toyota in general. So. Absolutely. Is that open to the public or is the museum uh, employee only we or have, kind of so, a VIP thing or? Well, uh, it, is so it the, change. It, so there is a museum on campus that you can visit. Oh, cool. Uh, um, you, they don't house all the cars there. Of course. Yeah, uh, yeah. but they do circulate some of them often. Uh, I think right now it, it, it's been down for reno- renovation. We went through some big, uh, renovations during the COVID period. Yeah. Um, cause you know, 
no yeah. one was there. Good time uh, to do construction. Yeah, I'd have to check to see if they've reopened. Um, I don't think they have yet, but yeah. uh, if if it is, uh, you can you can go into the front lobby, open to the public. You can ask for a tour, and uh, you, it's it's right in the main lobby. You go up to the right. There's a big stairway that that shows you a lot of cool things. They have a manufacturing. Um, uh, segment there that shows kind of the history and, and and just how we do our factories. They have a virtual tour. They did have oh, a virtual cool. tour, um, which if you've ever been to a, a manufacturing plant, oh, talk yeah. about impressive. Well, that's that's <laughs> probably one of the most unique things Toyota ever came was a just the whole mindset and whole philosophy. The Toyota production system, yeah. exactly. Yeah. I actually just bought a book on the whole topic just because it's if you want to describe it or I describe it, just it was revolutionary for the automotive industry, especially. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and it's it's been a it's been a staple in, in a lot of businesses. Um, yeah. you know, n- not even not even automotive, just just in general. The the Toyota way oh, yeah. uh, is adopted by by so many because it it just works. It yeah. works from a business standpoint, works from a quality standpoint, it works from um, you know, a customer expectation standpoint. It, it's oh. just something that you know, if you don't know much about it, um, read those books. Uh, you know, you can be, you can apply it to your life. You can apply it to to your business, and, and it, it just it. We preach it quite regularly uh, yeah. within within all the um, uh, aspects of, of Toyota, and, and I think it's it's a, it's a really good thing. And then rudimentary speaking, I mean, please correct me if I'm wrong, but the philosophy uh, for the folks that don't know, I mean, back in the day, it used to be the philosophy of an automotive production line: you know, bam, 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 punch them out. You know, assemble it as soon as possible, and if they stop at the end. We'll set it aside, then we'll maybe fix it, probably. <laughs> um, probably. But Toyota, they empower each and every one of their assembly line employees. So even if it's a quarter way through the production of the vehicle, the employee can actually, you know, they pull down a sign or they'll make a signal and say, the hand hey, on. They yeah, call exactly. It the hand on. Yep. We need to fix this now and actually fix it in real time. Yep. So it's fixed before it gets to the end. And that, I mean, I know when Toyota first came to North America, GM and all these uh, legacy automotive companies, partner with them so they can learn about that and help them set up production in North America. Absolutely. It was such a revolutionary idea. And it's one of the reasons Toyotas are darn near bulletproof in quality. <laughs> I mean, they just don't yeah. break. <laughs> yeah. They, they, I mean, you, you've, you've got pretty much the, the, the gist of it. Um, you know, Toyota does have, does empower just everyone there to, to be able to call out um, problem areas. Um, you know, it's not just fixing it on the line. Uh, generally, um, you know, if, if it's something that that's small, that can be, you know, it's not just fixing it. It's yeah. it's finding out why. We, exactly. we do we do root cause analysis. The five why is a whole big deal for for quality insurance. And and the guys at the plant they just they put so much effort into making sure that quality outflow problems don't occur. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, if you see an issue, I think as you were talking, um, some manufacturers of old uh, would would set them aside, say that's that's scrap part, or you know we'll figure it out later. No, no, you stop what you're doing. You figure out why this broke. If it's something you can fix, fix it, mm-hmm. not the car, yeah. the process. Exactly. You know, fix why it broke in the first place. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that's how you uh, uh, kind of come about with, with our biggest philosophy is Kaizen, right? Continuous exactly. improvement. You know, how can you always make sure that you're doing something better? And nothing is ever good enough. It's yeah. just waiting for a next opportunity for improvement. Exactly. So that's that's a big, big part of how Toyota operates. It's still, I remember when I was a kid, the first time I was kind of introduced to Toyota, or I saw it, I remember I was watching Top Gear, and they were doing one of those, you know, destroy car episodes where they beat a car to the point where it'll break, and they had like five different manufacturers with five different models. And I think they had the, I think it was a Toyota Celica. They were, you know, beating these cars, you know, literally hitting them with, you know, bricks and stuff, taking, them off, taking a, you know, four-door car off-roading, you know, mm-hmm. Completely unrealistic, perhaps inappropriate things for what the car was engineered for. But at the end of the episode, the Toyota still ran, well, although others broke. And they're like, "Okay, what would it take to break this?" So they finally just they drained the <laughs> they drained the fluids from the car. Yeah. So they got rid of the engine oil and all that. And it still did a couple laps. Like yeah. it's still ra- like, oh yeah, yeah, it no, is astonishing that. how reliable the whole platform is. Yeah, it really is. And, and I don't know if you remember the the Hilux episode. Oh. I so back in back in uh, oh gosh, this was such 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 a long time ago. But it was uh, there was a red Hilux that Top Gear did everything they could to destroy the car. They they dumped it into the ocean. Yes, yes, uh, I remember that point. And and they basically just they brought it back to life. They brought right? back, all they yeah. did was they, they drained <laughs> the water out of the block, changed the spark plugs, or I don't think they even changed the spark. I think they just yeah. emptied them out, cleaned out the cylinders, and it fired back up. Because they were on like an icy patch when they were doing that, I think, right? 
Uh, maybe I don't remember. I don't remember all the deals a long time ago. But yeah. I mean, I think they they dropped a, a house on it. I mean, yeah. it, it was and, <laughs> and it still ran. And, and I remember subsequent episodes had that that Hilux sitting on a on a plaque on a wall. Yeah. Uh, in their studio and and just always looking at it, going, yeah, that thing survived a lot, <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's just brilliant engineering. And then kind of springboarding off of that, what was your first uh, role when you first you know walked through those doors? You had your orientation. What were you working on? So my first role there was, you know, they, they, they do things where at, at, at least on the, in the, in the facility that I worked at. So I, I work in, um, now I work in the, the, the uh, service parts and accessory development side. Um, uh, but pr- prior to that, I was doing rotations in several of the different groups that they had. Mm-hmm. Uh, and one of them was our quality assurance group, essentially, um, responsible for uh, monitoring and uh, bringing to attention appropriate parties for field quality issues, you know, something that were to happen that did get, you know, there's, there's a durability issue that was found in the field that, you know, it didn't quite, you know, um, meet our expectations or customers expectations. You know, we would take those reports back and, Mm -hmm. and figure out, you know, how can we improve the car? You know, how can we, um, you know, is is that failure mode, was it accounted for and can we design something better or Mm -hmm. is there a process in the manufacturing side of things that maybe, needs to be looked at because some one of our tools that the suppliers use to provide us are, are out of round and not maintenance right or something right. like that. You know, so I was in that, in that field, um, doing uh, a lot of, um, work, working with, with those, you know, if, if there's any field quality issues, mm-hmm. you know, I, I was actually in the, the high critical side. So anything that was, that was, um, uh, of high importance, safety related, uh, electrical oh, yeah. side that, that was, that Air, was airbags and all that. Yeah. Safety. Airbags, yep. ADA, uh, the ABS brakes uh, um, and, yep. and all of the ADAS stuff, which is like the automated driving, uh, parameters. So, oh, yeah. so, so the, the, the parking brake is or not parking brake, the lane assist and stuff like that. It'll, it'll yeah. nudge you back in the right lane. Exactly. And start to exactly. Go over a little bit. Yep. Yep. All, all those systems were part of it. Um, so that was, that was a, a pretty awesome experience because you see, you get to interact with, with everyone, yeah. um, kind of like the, the uh, uh, you know, get to put yourself in the customer's voice and say, you know, this is what we want to make sure the customers are happy because if the customer's not happy, you're not going to buy our car, right? So right. we, we want to make sure that, that the, the car's in, in, um, you know, fixed and, and done right. And so, yeah. you know, having all those reports, seeing in the problems, I can say it's a lot less than I thought. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. But that was my first role. That was my and then where do you go from there internally in terms of your next role at Toyota? So after that, um, so that, that, that portion of the, of the, the QA department was, was kind of global. It was, it was enterprise wise. So it was the actual, uh, OE side, oh, uh, wow. non-accessory. It was the actual, you know, uh, the ADAS systems and the ABS yep. systems. What I moved into was my next role was through the uh, service parts and accessories. So we're kind of a smaller group where we do, we do develop, um, um, you know, the, well, the accessories, it's yeah. kind of in the name. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, and I've bounced around, they each have their own um, areas. They'll have a development side, they'll have a quality engineering side, they'll have a quality assurance side, they'll have a planning side, they have, you know, all these different aspects. It's kind of like a compartmentalized um, manu- uh, 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 Toyota. It's like a yeah. little baby Toyota in the Toyota. Oh, yeah. um, and so I've, I went around in the development side, I did quality uh, engineering, uh, which is basically plant interface, uh, production, um, um, uh, production engineering side of things, post, post design yeah. as, elect- as quality engineering. And then I did quality assurance, which was basically um, post production uh, oh, really? side of, of, of the parts. So I had, I had experience in the development of the parts, in the manufacturing of the parts, and maintaining the field quality of the part. So kind of whole, whole life cycle. Gamut. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and ended up, I worked in the quality assurance side for about a year, or the uh, quality engineering side for about a year as a, as a you know, got hired on no longer uh, a, uh, what, what, they, what they called them, um, uh, engineering associate trainees. That's yeah. that's why I got bounced around a bunch because uh, they really foster a, a um, exposure oh, yeah. uh, like kind of model. Sl- like you see a bunch of the parts of the business. Yeah, yeah it helps really, you know, uh, be able to, to, to sink into where we might find improvement opportunities, you know, it's absolutely. It, yeah. So if you see one side struggles with this because of another department, when you go to yeah. another department, you see why, and maybe there's a, a learn from each other. Yeah, yeah exactly. Really? It's, it's big, big, big there. So, yeah. um, I, I did do a, uh, a stint in quality engineering for about a year. And then now currently, uh, about a year and a half now, I've been in the development, uh, engineer, 
on the, on the electrical side. So I'm responsible oh, really? for a lot of our uh, electrical accessories that that we put on those vehicles. And we now do. Uh, it was before most of our accessories were um, either port installed. So at, at the GST um, yeah. sites, you know, we would we would have accessories installed at that point, mm-hmm. that install point, or at the dealership. So customer would buy it uh, after they bought their car and say, "I would yeah. really like to have." Uh, extra extra lights in the top. Yeah, for like the yeah. Scions back in the day, you know, oh, they, yeah. they'd have those those lighting kits. You know, oh, those yeah. were all developed by um, uh, my group. Uh, oh, cool. Yeah, from before. And now uh, we're into, we have a third install point that's kind of being pushed where we actually oh, really? have in the manufacturing process, we'll install accessories. Really? Yeah, which is a really unique deal. It's yeah. a very unique deal. And um, uh, it's a, it's a, it's a, tough opportunity because we are our timelines are truncated uh, because we feel the need of the manufacturer outside of the uh, actual OE side we feel the yeah. needs that that are either not able to be met or um, you know there's I guess opportunities that were found after the planning uh, yeah. freeze of things you know like for instance you know we'll do and th- th- these are small examples um, I can't really say about some of the of other course. big uh, examples I understand but, that um, uh, some of the small examples are like for instance we do a um, illuminated door sills right? oh, yeah. you don't think anything about those being uh, illuminated on the when you open the door you see the door sill illuminates that's oh, yeah. you know those are accessories. Oh, yeah. um, Maybe the planning didn't didn't come up with the idea, or it wasn't on their their docket to create. But customers yeah. have ha- a high demand for it, you know. Oh yeah. And so uh, our group put it together. We also do things like you know we just announced and and SEMA 2022 um, a trailer camera accessory that's going to be launched in the 24 model year of the full size trucks. That I'm a big part of that development. Oh, cool. Um, and that's a very big electrical accessory that's integrated into the vehicle. It's a wireless camera system. It's, it's pretty neat. Really? Um, How's yeah. that work? So just sort of for the non-technical folks, you hook it up to the car's Bluetooth or what was the whole, no, no, it's, what was the whole process like? It's, it's, it's integrated in that it's proprietary integration. So oh, really? it, it actually goes through um, our vehicle systems uh, so that you have, uh, you utilize the head unit itself. There's, there's a menu option for you to operate it on the head unit to have a full um, a human interface, uh, um, uh, human machine interface oh, yeah. right there on the on the screen and and also in our our electronic display mirrors so you'll have wirelessly streamed video that you can put on the back of a trailer that will stream in your e mirror when you're driving around so you can make lane changes safely and really and, uh, on the head unit itself you get to see um, uh, you know backing up yeah. kind of like a backup camera um, kind of deal so yeah that we we, we kind of showcased that in, in, at SEMA this year or last year um, and uh, Hopefully we'll have that product rolling out pretty soon. So that's incredible. Yeah, it's a brilliant idea. Yeah, yeah. It's it's really true, especially more and more customers wanting to accessorize their car, make it more custom to themselves. I mean, it's just a big value add because, of course, you know, car guys and you know, we love to have a one of, you know, a unique piece of history or unique piece in our garage. Oh yeah, of course. And just of course makes you smile more. And yeah. You only know, have one of the unique models that has that. That's fantastic. You get to be part of that, uh, be part of the development side of things too, because you know. The, Technically, this would be uh, being it being wireless, yeah, um, and it being from an OE, kind of an OE first. No other, no other yeah, company, I was about to say, cause no other I, manufacturers done in a wireless system like this. Because I know other truck, uh, other manufacturers with their trucks, they had a program or they had a idea of you know you have the whole surround of the cameras, mm-hmm. but it was a very expensive dealer only installed option, and you know they have hundreds of I don't know I was about to say miles, hundreds of miles, but you know about hundreds of feet of you know cords going yeah. out the whole yeah. thing, which. Yep. Introduce complexities in the uh, in them of itself as yep. well. <laughs> Puts a burden on the customer to find a good good safe routing and exactly. And we're 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 big on on r- routing quality assurance for our wiring and making sure that you know safety is played into and and that was one of the drives for us going in, into the, to the wireless side was that yep. you know having to to being able to minimize that burden on the customer to find mm-hmm. a way to route their 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 wire safely because you know we don't want to make it. I mean we 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 can't we can't guarantee where a customer is going to install it. You know, it's, yeah. it's their trailer. It's, I mean, if it was going to the car, <laughs> that's one thing, but it's yeah. going to a trailer. Yeah. That's kind of out of our scope of, of what we can control. So wireless seemed like it was a good, a good push forward to not only advance the technology of, of that, but the convenience for the customer too. So. Oh, absolutely. A lot, a lot of people don't realize when it comes to, you know, automotive electronics, usually one of the biggest, you know, red flags of why is this not working? So when people start, you know, slicing and going into the <laughs> wiring harnesses and, plugging on accessories that aren't engineered to sync with the whole car yeah. 
I mean, <laughs> yeah, the, the, the development that goes into assuring that the cars play nice with each other just yeah. within its own development is, is pretty substantial when you start introducing elements outside of those many, 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 many discussions, you, you tend to, you tend to, um, uh, start, uh, it's harder to guarantee things that work right. You know, oh, especially yeah. now when, you know, you've got, uh, you know, thin aluminum wires for communication. You've got so many oh, different, yeah. uh, I mean, can is no longer just can. You know, yeah. they, there's so many different protocols. Within what's, what's CAN for the folks? Con who are controller, in, in control the area network. Uh, it's mm -hmm. basically a, a communication bus that uh, has been around in vehicles f for a very, very long time, many decades. Um, it's it's how the it's how each computer within a car talks to each other computer. It, it delivers messages, and so how, for instance, if if um, uh, uh, traction control is a good example, right? You mm -hmm. know, your ABS computer would get wheel speed sensors and yep. relay that to the engine control that says, hey, you're spinning. You might want to retard some of that timing. And yep. the engine says, oh, I see that. Thank you very much. Let me yep. let me stop. That communication is through the can. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, we've gotten a lot more complex, a lot different kinds of, you know, there's, yeah. I don't want to get too technical, oh, yeah. <laughs> but uh, there's there's a lot of different protocols out there now. And, 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 and even more, um, even more than that, there's different protocol buses or uh, communication buses that are outside of can, you know. Yeah. Um, that we, that vehicles utilize, so they get really complex, and if you start introducing other things into them, they can um, it can be difficult. It can be difficult. Oh, absolutely, out of curiosity, just kind of somewhat tangent question: Do you think it'll get to the point where the cars become more and more wireless with those computer devices? Because with the wires, you have the you do have reliability, but you also have some complexity, and, re and also as you know, rats and other critters, especially in winter, they love to climb to the engine bay and chew away at wires. I almost wonder might that be part of the automotive future where you're making the individual components, computers of the car talk to each other wirelessly. Yeah, or, yeah. I don't know. I can't say that that's never been discussed. Yeah. Because um, it has been. But, yeah. you know, uh, currently... Cost you know, complexity. and yeah. Well, I think you may know about this a little bit more than, than, than most folks at home, but security is a big deal. Oh, very true. You I mean, introduce wireless yep. systems, you introduce entry points for security that, yep. you know... You can you can only predict so much when it comes to security. Uh, you agree. Know, there, there's there's always going to be a need to upgrade and and countermeasure and and you know you know hackers out there they they do everything they can to yeah. find vulnerabilities and no matter how much you plan, there's always a vulnerability somewhere. I think someone yeah. said a long time ago, if a human made it, a human could break it, right? <laughs> exactly. So, um, I kind of I think you know. I'm not saying that wireless, there are lots of wireless things that are coming in oh, yeah. um, ev everywhere. Uh, you know, there's been talks about whole whole wireless vehicles, but, yeah. you know, I think a lot of security questions that are, are going to be the main thing that kind of keeps that down the road a little bit further. <laughs> okay. No, I agree. I mean, yeah. I remember it maybe five or six years, a couple of years ago, there was a really big article in Wired Magazine where some hackers, you know, completely remotely, you know, I think it was in with an eye distance, but... They were able to hack into, I think, I believe it was a Jeep Grand Cherokee on the highway, mm. take over the controls of the vehicle, slow it down, put yeah. it out into the park or the the no drive lane, and stop it completely. Yeah. And they were 100% wireless. They just yeah. they were able to hack into the vehicle and take it over completely. Yeah, there was a, <laughs> there was a, 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 gosh, I don't remember how long ago this was, and I and I and, and honestly, I don't even know if this if the, the true details and how accurate this was, because at the time I wasn't in the engineering side, but when I heard the story, but it basically it was, I think someone was able to infiltrate um, some of the, the Priuses, the, the next, the, like the second or third generation Priuses when they first came out through their tire pressure monitoring systems. I heard some of the story. Um, basically, they were able to find a uh, route of entry through those yeah. and was able to, I think, either gather data or um, introduce false data. Nothing malicious happened, I don't think. Uh, but it was, it was something, it was reported that they were able to get into yeah. it. So, you know, if, and I, I, again, I wasn't part of Toyota at the time, oh, yeah. but I would gather that a lot of our security countermeasures that I see now that are implemented in, into Toyota and all of yeah. our products that probably had a pretty big role into kicking all of that off, you know? And, oh, absolutely. And so we, we have a lot of standard practices that, that keep, you know, um, give the bad guys out. Yeah. So that. It is one of those concerning things, like with my IT company, most of how we assist companies and businesses is, is with their IT security. And it is, it's a never ending game of cat and mouse ever Absolutely. since the computer was invented. I Absolutely. mean, and, it, and, yeah. I, and I don't know if it'll ever stop, to be honest. I think security is no. always going to be <laughs> something that, that is needed when it comes to uh, uh, our technology growth that we see. Uh, it's only, I mean, the threats are only, only 
the threats of IT security are only going to keep increasing because the human race keeps increasing the reliability and use of technology. So, I mean, we yeah. talk about cars. Na- a car nowadays is almost a data center on our wheels compared to, you know, 60s and 50s before you had all those computers and modules. Now, is some cars, especially electric cars, they are a pure, it's a technological machine. Yeah. I mean, it's a data yeah. center on wheels. They're talking, oh, yeah. especially yeah. if they're, a lot of them, they talk to the headquarters in terms of, you know, network relay and sending information back, which mm-hmm. does have some benefits. I know, um, there, what was, um, su- have you heard of a super speeder Rob on YouTube? Uh, I can't say that I have, sorry. He's, he has, um, he's known for having a rental automotive exotic cars and something in his industry with automotives that's really concerning is the rollback of odometers because mm-hmm. that's yes. how you make, yes. exact, he estimates like 60% of exotic cars are rollbacks, which for folks who don't know is when you, it used to be the drill, you could roll back the odometer to make, decrease the mileage, which of course increases the value of the car. And he did note that with technology, one of the ways manufacturers are stopping that practice is with communications with the company. So like when he was leasing, I think it was a Chevy Bolt, mm-hmm. he couldn't lie on his lease with the mileage because mm-hmm. it's, a compu- it's, it's a computer on wheels. It's re- reporting yeah. to the General Motors, hey, this is how much he dropped, drive, yep. which is also scary because if they, ha- they know that, well, they also know where you drive because, you know, it's got GPS. So, I mean, it's, uh, yeah. it's a trade-off. It, 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 it is a thing. I mean, I think every manufacturer has some form of data collection. And, and you know, for Toyota, for the most part, I, I believe, and, and again, I'm not part of that 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 um, uh, department, but I believe right. we're, we're an opt-in company, right? So you right. have to opt in for that, that data to be collected. But I do know that we have data that we can utilize for diagnostics. I mean, oh, yeah. we, we have connected apps that will sit there and say, hey, we noticed that, you know, you are 5,000 miles, or you're, you know, 500 miles from your next oil change, or, yep. um, you know, you're, uh, you've got a check engine light on, you know, yep. would you like us to schedule an appointment? Is that intrusive? I mean, if it's, you opt in, yeah. no, it's a great reminder. Yeah. I have it on my truck. I love it. Absolutely. I, absolutely. I, I get a notification that, hey, I, I need to you get an oil oh, yeah. change. And I'm like, oh, you know what? I've been busy. Thank you. Oh, yeah. um, but at the same time, you're right. You know, there's, it's a trade-off. <laughs> There's a trade-off. I mean, they also know if I'm driving fast. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Now that, that, that's the thing. Insurance companies yeah. do the same thing, right? <laughs> oh uh, yeah. But uh, again, that's a that's a that's an opt-in thing for now, which oh, yeah. is I think you know hopefully it stays that way. I agree. Um, More choices the better. I think. Yeah. I mean, if you want it, great. It's convenience yeah. that can be super helpful. And and if you don't, then you know hopefully that 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 freedom remains. <laughs> oh, exactly. Agree. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But it is nice. I, I do love it. You know, no matter how much technology, I love that diversification of Toyota that. They still try. They still strive to make some, you know, automotive legendary for the sports segment. Oh yeah. As yeah, that, now you're speaking my language. Yeah. So t- <laughs> tell me a little bit about Toyota racing. I mean, I've been I've been fascinated about the past couple of years, but I know you're even more involved today. So I think I think there's a lot of um, uh, I guess appearance of how Toyota's been. Um, in, in the past, they've been reliable. Oh, yeah. um, they've been utilitarian perhaps. Yeah. yeah. Very utilitarian. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's a good way to put it. They, they, oh, yeah. because they have been, they're very utilitarian. They last oh, forever. They used for a lot of commercial applications, yeah. taxis, you know, I think, you know, Prius was the number one Uber driver or oh, Uber yeah. car, right? I mean, the uh, most, the most popular car sold in history is a Toyota, Toyota. Corolla. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So, you know, that, that rumor or not, not that rumor, that, that, Track uh, record or trend, uh, yeah, yeah, the, uh, um, vision of, of Toyota has, has always been around. And, and I think um, our, our CEO, and I'm not going to speak for him, but I, the things that I know about him, he's, yeah. he is in motorsports. He is, Excellent. Uh, but Maurizio is, is yeah. his, his, his uh, um, uh, pseudonym for, for racing. Like he's, he races races. And I think when he took over the company looking to kind of drive Toyota into that direction. So mm-hmm. you have to, Bear in mind, Toyota's huge. Oh yeah, <laughs> we're they a actually very big. I think it was the first company. time ever. Was it? I remember 2022. Toyota was is the first time ever. They, I think, in 30 plus years, they beat GM yeah. for number of units sold. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It was yeah. incredibly an incredible achievement. Yeah, but the downside of having a big company like that is things move very slowly. You yes. know, um, yeah. you know, there's a lot of checks and balances that have to go through, and a lot of people need to agree and, and execute, and so. You know, they when he took it over, I forget what the year, but a while, while back ago, and I think he had that vision of, of you know developing a um, uh, more of a uh, bringing back, I should say, bringing back the the racing heritage that yeah. you know if you remember back in the '90s, the Toyota era of cars, oh, yeah. um, <laughs> you know you had a lot of of sports oriented vehicles right. coming out of Japan. You know, you've got the Skyline, the right, Seven, the Supra, yeah. the, um, you know the the GTO that which the 3000 oh, GT. Yeah. I mean, all of these sports cars. Uh, the NSX, one of my favorite cars. Yeah, you know, these, all these, all these cars had this, had this, this 
sports car mentality that just yeah. kind of over the time it, it you know became most car companies became more utilitarian and, and or at least they're not poster childing their, their they don't, sports they don't cars. seem to advertise them as much yeah. to your point if you turn on a tv for folks who still have cable these days <laughs> but i mean what's that yeah ex exactly <laughs> <laughs> it's like even on youtube with the commercials you really don't see a lot of the sports car. You see, I mean, perhaps it makes sense. They set, they seem to advertise the ones that have the highest number of units sold. Of course, so of course, you, why not? Yeah, right? Exactly. Yeah. So I mean, for volume, you're getting a better bang for your buck because you're selling millions of those cars as opposed to the more niche cars. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's gonna be a fraction or maybe a tenth of the volume of units sold. So yeah. 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 For the company, it makes sense. You that you know more profit to pay your employees to reinvest in the technology. So yeah. I definitely see that. But I miss the kind of the golden day of the exciting. Do you remember? The billboard is still in California. Is it San Francisco? But they, during a storm, the poster on the billboard, the newer one, fell off, so you could see what was under it. It was a Supra. It was. It was. I think it's a Mark IV Supra, the one really? that's really Fast and Furious. Yeah, it's oh, a, I didn't know that. Yeah, it's still on a billboard in oh, California. I have to check that out. Oh, it was, and it's it was the last year I think that they painted. So the billboards. Oh were yeah. Posted, they used yeah, to they paint. Used to be so painted. They, yeah. A beautiful painting of that black yeah. Supra, and. You know, after that, that was the last painted. So every other billboard ad after that, they just you know put the vinyl billboard on top of it. it. Yeah. And then a couple years back, the the Wallpaper, vinyl one fell off. Yeah. yeah. It fell yeah. off, and you could see it. And it huge automotive news. And huh. Yeah. I, I mean, missed that one. It's it's incredible. That is awesome. I, I almost feel like uh, you know Harrison Ford. Like it belongs in a museum. <laughs> like it, I mean, yeah, you're not yeah. wrong. I mean, you know, especially now, like I said, we're we're uh, you see a lot of manufacturers ushering in this new age of. The sports car. Yeah. Um, you know, we saw it in the 90s, and I think history is kind of starting to repeat itself a little bit, where a lot more interest in driving is starting, to, is starting to, to come back. Yep. Um, I think for a while there, and, and it's not for everyone. It, of course. It, it isn't. You know, as I mentioned earlier, diversity in the, in the car world. You know, oh, some yeah. people care less about driving. Oh, yeah. Some people don't even, they, their hobbies are walking. You yeah. know, that's the opposite. Oh, yeah. of <laughs> exactly. So, you know, it's, it's not for everyone, but I think a lot of people are fostering in this new age of, of uh, being able to drive their car um, in a performance setting. So, yeah. you know, track days. Exactly. And, and um, just in general, having uh, a ton of fun with getting to point A to point B. It's not always about point B anymore. Exactly. Or, or, or it did, you know, in the nineties they had that, I think there was an advertisement somewhere that was like, it's not about the, the point B, it's about the journey. Exactly. Like, uh, oh, this, that's, that's a famous, I know so many famous quotes, but I forget who says them. So I always say like, as a wise man once said, it's as like, a wise man once yeah, said, yeah, as a wise yeah. man once said, it's yeah. life's a journey, not a destination. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And so, you know, cars used to do that. And I, and I think Toyota is starting or not starting to, but they've, they've been pushing this, this excitement yeah. drive into their cars. I mean, it started with, uh, you know, one of the more mundane cars that we've had for a while, the Camry, right? Oh, yeah. I, I can say it. Ca Camrys have been very utilitarian, and well, they've been something that you bought because you needed it. You needed it to work. You needed space. But if you look at the Camrys now, they look pretty they impressive. They still have that yeah. reliability. Oh, yeah. Man, they look great. The, Especially the, the TR. Is it the TRT? The, the, the TRD. The package looks yep. amazing. I saw yep. one on the road a couple weeks back. I had to do a double check. I'm like, that? Yeah. That's some vehicle engineering design work. When I was in QE, I was responsible for the exhaust system on that one. As oh, well, really? As well as a couple of the components. And same with that, and I think we had an Apex Corolla that does the same situation. So I mean, like we we were fostering in that performance aspect of these cars, and and yeah. and you know the Camry, <laughs> the the specs on paper are matching what my car was in the yeah. you know my my I have a GTR now, oh yeah, uh, uh, an R thirty three GTR, um, and the same specs for that car is in that one. So I mean, it's fun. It's, it's fun to drive, yeah. um, and so it's you know as we now move into the Supra, um, you know. It, GR has come out with um, quite a few platforms that, uh, that that foster that same sentiment. You know, the GR Corolla, the GR, GR Just for the folks down in the automotive industry, what's the GR stand for again? Gazoo Racing. Oh, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, which is, you know, Toyota's come up with several um, racing teams over its lifetime. There's Toyota Racing. There's uh, Toyota Racing Development. Uh, oh, yeah. There's now GR, G Gazoo Racing. And and each time there there's there's some aspect that uh, we get involved with with either small time racing, big time racing, mm -hmm. uh, but you know racing has always been a part of Toyota. Yeah. Um. And and now we're getting back into providing that sentiment into our into our vehicles. I think um, you know you look at the the GR Corolla. Oh yeah. Um, we have a Maurizio edition as a tribute to, uh, to Akio Toyota. Um. It's just a it's just a phenomenal platform. I mean. Uh, 
uh, uh, a Corolla, a beefed up wide body Corolla. I mean, yeah. who does that now? I mean, it's <laughs> from the factory. Yeah, yeah. that's I mean, awesome. I mean, yeah, you, the 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 Civic did it with the with the Type R for, oh, for yeah. a little while, and that was something that was like, oh my gosh, that's that's crazy. Yeah. You, know, you get this amazing car, and the same with now the Corolla, and and it's just I feel like as we're going into this new era, we're going to see a little bit of a trend. You know, the cars go through trends. We had a oh, big yeah. SUV trend oh, yeah. a while back ago. We and then we had a small SUV crossover trend, and now yeah. I hope hoping. We're getting into my language again. We're yeah. getting into the sports car and 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 performance car trend, and and yeah. hopefully we'll start seeing a lot more of those up and coming. And you know, I, I'm excited about that. I was really excited when Toyota. They do a great job of listening to consumers too. They they released is it so now the Toyota Super GR comes with the stick shift too. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. The 23 um, 23 model year has a uh, has a six speed manual, and and you know, uh, hopefully it 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 it's successful. You know. Oh, yeah. um, Hope not everyone that that has that opinion goes out and buys them, but oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's the hard part. Yeah, ho- hopefully, hopefully they do. Um, you know, I I think, I think it's it is important to note that that Toyota does does listen to their customers. I mean, Absolutely. You have, when you call that one eight hundred voice, uh, that one eight hundred number for for voicing your opinion, the voice of the customer. Yeah, um, that's a big thing at, at Toyota. Like I was saying, I was in the quality side at the beginning, and we were always looking out for that. So, yeah. you know, again, big company, things move slow, but oh, yeah. voice is always heard. Absolutely. Yeah. It's really cool like, how kind of all the different types of racing Toyota supports, especially with like the, the, no, the local level, like with NASA or no. NASA. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think, uh, and, and again, I'm not in the marketing side of things. So I don't know all oh, the yeah, details. So yeah. uh, forgive me if I say something wrong or, or um, you know, maybe I omit something. But yeah, the, the Toyota, uh, Toyota does offer... Um, Basically, a track day with NASA yep. if you buy a Supra, which is, uh, a, and I think maybe the GR oh yeah, so eighty six too. Oh yeah, so yeah, so it, which for folks to um, know, uh, NASA is the North American Track Association, so it's like a race club, and they re, you know you rent the track, and yeah, so I was, and this is just um, I was looking at the Toyota website just to triple check. So yeah, every Toyota eighty six as well as every Supra comes yep. with a one year free membership as well as a one. One, one free day. track day. Yeah, exactly. Which, which, if you're into track, you know that that's a big deal. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's, uh, those things, I think um, my, my last track day was like $450 for the two days. So yeah. it, it adds up. It nice. adds up. It adds up. Especially when you go, you know, once a month or oh, yeah. twice or a month. Up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah, it, it but add up for sure. It's awesome to see that foster. Because, I mean, one of the things about, you know, every hobby is you really want to get the next generation and you know, expand the group so you have more of a community. And a lot of people don't realize, you know, Anyone can really get into racing. Money helps, of course, but I mean, there are a lot of entry level great vehicles where you can get into the sport, get exposed to the great clubs, the communities. Yeah, and it's yeah. an awesome experience. It. Yeah, going out to the track can be daunting. Oh yeah, uh, it can it can be um, overwhelming. Uh, as a matter of fact, that's where I met you, right? Oh, yeah, exactly. We were, we were at the track together. <laughs> I, and I almost ran out of memory on my phone from taking so many pictures. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, you, yeah. Uh, my car does t- tend to turn heads. Oh yeah, uh, but. It, even more than that, you know, I think we, we both, uh, you know, we're somewhat fresh to the track experience and, yeah. and you know, um, having to get out there for the first time, um, you know, with you taking control of a car going, you know, 120 miles an hour into a 90 degree turn. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's 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 intimidating. It's very intimidating. Oh, yeah. um, you know, knowing what to bring, making sure your car's tip top, because that's yep. that's that's important. You know, you want to make sure the car is doing well, especially oh, yeah. I have a 25 year old, 26 year old car, 27 year old car. Oh yeah. Um, you know, I got to make sure it's a tip top shape. So one of the things that um, I've discovered through my ventures going out there is is a, is a group that I'm now a big part of called Hashtag Race Car, and it's not not pound sign race car. Uh, it's, I was about to ask. It's <laughs> written out Hashtag Race Car. It's Hashtag Hashtag Race Car. Oh really? Yeah yeah yeah. <laughs> um, great group of guys. You know, they they took me in when I was fresh and and just you know super interested in this. In developing the hobby, I've always been into cars. I've always done the right. driving and the showing and the and the modifying and the having fun that way. But you know, I've always had a dream of going out on track. Who doesn't, oh, yeah. right? I didn't realize how easy it is I, to get started. Yeah, it's just daunting if you don't know anything. Well, I, it's also, I guess, it's a kind of a perception thing. Just as a kid, I always thought you had to be a millionaire. I, I always yeah. thought you needed a lot of, you know, copious amounts of money to actually or, just get or on a track. Or a special car or exactly. a special license yeah. or whatever have you. No, no, yeah. no. You, you don't need any of that. You just go out there and, and, and you start off fresh. Oh, yeah, you know, of you'll eventually get into those things if you want them. You don't oh, yeah. have to. Uh, but in, in any event, you know, we, we uh, became part of this this group, Hashtag Race Car, and, and their whole premise, the whole reason they exist is to foster this positive yeah. uh, environment for newcomers and, and veterans alike. 
uh, kind of breed this positive environment to to be good stewards of of the sport, you know, yeah. to to provide help. You know, when 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 I went, um, there's two individuals there that kind of you know founded the founded the whole event, uh, Justin and, and Chris, um, just just absolute angels of people. I mean, yeah. these these guys, they have you know they bring all the tools necessary they need for their own cars, and mm -hmm. you know you may. I have a checklist that I go through oh, yeah. and I pack my, my car. I drive out there. I don't actually yeah. have a trailer, but I drive my car out Same. there, pack it full of whatever I can. And yep. then, you know, whatever I, I, I need, hopefully I brought it. Exactly. And you know, sometimes that track, that list is incomplete because yep. I didn't run into that problem. Well, next time I'll put it on. But anyway, the, these guys, they'll always have stuff out there for you. You know, they'll always support, um, you know, if you, if you, if you get on the group, they, they, um, Make sure that if you need assistance, that they can help provide it any way they can. They they can provide physical assistance. They can provide refer referential assist assistance. Um, a lot of them like to foster a a uh, instructor like vibe where, yeah. you know, if you're at a plateau and you're performance driving and really yeah. want to get at the next level, because again, that's the whole point, right? Oh, yeah. so drive Advanced. faster, faster. Yeah. And I can tell you when I first started, I was, I was slow. I thought I was oh, fast. Yeah. <laughs> I was so slow. I yeah. was so slow. And, and even now I'm probably still slow, but I'm much faster, you know, and, and oh, yeah. it keep, keeps, keep, keeps getting faster and faster. And so, you know, a lot of it uh, is, is fostering that community and, and making sure that, it, that, that people like me and you yeah. uh, can, can get that uh, um, feel comfortable oh, in yeah. doing the sport because it's dangerous. Oh, yeah. it is, but it's a lot of fun. Absolutely. That, well, fun. that's one of the reasons too. I chose NASA as an organization just because I did a lot of research and asked my friends like, what's for a new guy, what's the safest, you know, the one, the best track record of having a safe class where, you know, for, there's not a lot of crashes or burns or something yeah. like that. And yeah. a lot of the, tr a lot of people are worried about going to the track. There's a lot of, thankfully there's a lot of open fields. Mm -hmm. So if you do go yeah. off the track, it's not, you know, as dangerous as you would think. It depends it on can the be. track. It, it oh, depends yeah. on the track. Yeah. There's, it's there's true. several <laughs> tracks that go to that. I mean, you don't want to give the false sense of security on because the tracks are different. I think Hallett's got a little bit more of a, you know, yeah. Cause you have that one concrete barrier yeah. for when you're getting on the track. ECR so too. Oh, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, but but the even more so NASA because I, I I'm familiar with with Andy and, and BJ who, oh, yeah. are, who are previously the directors I think they still are oh, but, yeah, they, saw. but uh, they got a new uh, a new, new ownership yeah, yeah, Scott, Na NASA Texas yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, NASA Texas that's right yeah. sure. um, but but Andy and BJ they're, they 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 just absolutely um, uh, focus on safety oh, yeah. and and instill it to all the drivers out there making sure everyone's on the same page because that's important because you're not there by yourself oh, yeah you're sharing that track with others even though oh, you're yeah. not competing. In certain of the HPD programs, they yeah. NASA does do time trial and oh, yeah. wheel to wheel. So it's separate classes, separate. We're time. talking about yeah. HPD yeah. here right now, which is for um, the people getting introduced to the sport and getting comfortable on the track and high the performance the driving education. Exactly, that's what it is. So it's basically how you how, how to learn, or it's it's learning how to drive your vehicle quickly and and, and efficiently and, oh, yeah. and and safely. Um, and so uh, NASA, I think, is a big big program that that fought, that that really caters to that safety side. So does. Uh, most of other HPDEs, but I, I do believe NASA's got one of the better ones. A Chin, oh, yeah. Chin Events also got a very good uh, track record for that. Um, yeah, so I mean, you know, if you're ever in in the in the um, uh, have interest in doing that, reach out oh, yeah. to those companies and or those organizations. Oh, yeah. I should Na say they got a website NASA Texas. You look at the schedule, and yep. one of the most in, one of the nice um, the things that made me feel less intimidated, especially so for the first class. Every time you're on the track, you have an instructor in the car with you, telling mm -hmm. you exactly what to do and when to do it. Yep. Yep. So that 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 helped me get over my concern of, well, this is my daily driver. I don't want to crash it, but I do want to have fun. <laughs> like, have fun. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And and that's the beautiful thing about it is, is the more you go into it, the more you get that uh, that uh, that experience to push the car further and further. And you know, before you know it, you're, you're starting to get competitive. Like me, I was the same oh, yeah. way. I mean, I I drive a, an R33 GTR. It's not exactly a a uh, common car out there and, and, no. you know, I don't want to go off either, but, uh, at this point now I've, I've, I think I've enjoyed it so much where I'm hoping to, um, in the near, very near future, start getting competitive into time trials and, and potentially being an instructor and all that kind of good stuff. And NASA yeah. is a good avenue where that's kind of helped, uh, help me at least identify the path that I want to go to. And then chin track days is also another uh, good organization that's fostered it. But most importantly, it's the, it's the hashtag race car folks that have really helped me helped drive me to push into, into being a better driver. It's, it's my biggest passion. Right there. Oh, yeah. it, it, it always has been. So now, what was it like importing the legendary GTR? Cause I know a, a lot of people don't realize for many years, it was this unobtainium just cause I think you were saying at the time, when you first got your first one, it was like one of seven in the DFW or uh, Texas area. And so there wasn't very many in yeah. Texas. No, there really wasn't. Um, and you know, for a long time, that uh, that importation has has been tainted by you know some some um, 
good practices and bad practices yeah. you know, along the way. There's there's some stigma against it, um, but you know basically, uh, there's you know companies out there that will that had tried to import them and, and they they did they tried to do everything by the book, but then maybe kind of fudged the numbers on a couple other models that yeah. they probably shouldn't have, um, and and it kind of put a black mark on on the skyline. Uh, the pra- the practice, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but now that uh, all these vehicles are are starting to hit a exemption timing, so yep. the twenty five year rule uh, is what most people know it as. It's it's actually different between the the National Highway Safety Administration and uh, ha- National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and uh, EPA uh, yeah. the Environmental Protection Agency. There's there's two different criteria, and you have yeah. to meet both of them. The longest. The earliest you can do is a 25 year. I think the EPA yeah. is a little bit, or the EPA is 25. I think NHTSA is yeah. a little bit sooner. But regardless, once you hit that 25 year mark, the process becomes easier yeah. um, to do it to do it correctly. Um, to yeah. do it to say that you can't bring in an, an yeah. R33 before that or, or Skyline before that isn't necessarily accurate. There's a lot yeah. of things that have to happen, um, almost to the point where majority of people don't do it right. Yeah. You know, and and, and oh, it, yeah. it, it's it's expensive. Cost prohibitive. Oh yeah. It's it's time prohibitive because you know you got to yeah. do a lot of the stuff really quickly and it's also uh, 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 resource prohibitive. Uh, there's not very many companies that can perform because no. you have to be um, an, an actual like you, you have to be licensed to do yeah. so. Like essentially, I, yeah, like an individual person can't just go out go, no. to, go to Japan. And be like, I can't hey, go buy a car. Here's cash. Let's yeah. get over. Now. Yeah, and <laughs> I can't. I can't even. I could. I could take the car in. Let's say I go to Japan and I yeah. make all of those modifications there in Japan that are necessary. Yeah. To foster it to being a yeah. legal car in, in the U.S. What's prior your, to twenty-five year old, oh yeah, that's still not acceptable. It has oh to yeah. be done by a a certified company uh, that goes through these checklist processes and, and has a has communication with the government that shows yep. them what they're doing. There's a there's a whole big list of forms you got to fill out, oh, all of yeah. these things. So um, it, it's not that easy. It's not easy at all. Um, Which is why I see so few of them. I mean, it's, yeah. What, and, and and now we're seeing a lot more because you know you that twenty-five year mark, yeah. you just a lot less paperwork. You know. Yeah, you, you don't have you, to worry about the all those. I mean, everything from the safety, the lights. I mean, there's a lot. There's a whole, of course, textbooks of you know how you need to properly import this yeah. vehicle, and it depends on the state too. So oh, yeah. here in Texas, it's just paperwork after the 25 year rule. You just got to make sure that customs signs off on it. You got to make sure the EPA have your you have your approved exemption, your NHTSA exemption. Uh, which are just forms you fill out, and and you know you have to pay for the forms, or what was that process, or what was the process like for you buying your first one? The first one, yeah. Uh, my wife handled that one. Oh, really? That's, that's <laughs> awesome. Yeah. yeah, we actually it was it was one that was already in the states, and oh, so okay. don't really know the process that much. So yeah. yeah. Uh, the second one was uh, done by me and the wife, kind of um, uh, together. Oh, cool. So basically. Uh, we found a brokerage company because in Japan I got mine through an auction. Yeah, and through through that you have to actually be licensed auction. You have to have a, an auctioneer license to to purchase something in Japan. So it's not like eBay where anyone with a credit card just go online, no. you buy whatever you, you want. You can find some on eBay, oh, uh, the really? J- yeah. Japan eBay, or you can yeah. even go to a dealership and buy them. So I didn't have to go this avenue, but this is the avenue that I found the one that I wanted because. As the price has creep, crept up, you know, you needed yeah. to, to be a little frugal and you know, oh, dealerships yeah. already knew that they're. Oh, yeah. They're yeah, collectibles so, now. I mean, yeah. well, they always were. Now they're, I mean, now they're pieces of history and exactly. it's all about fun. I mean, yeah. Exactly. So the one that I got was through an auction um, <laughs> and sight unseen. You know, I got a couple of pictures of it in a in a auction sheet yeah. that gave all the known issues that were seen by the auction inspector. Mm-hmm. Um so it was pretty risky. I'm not gonna lie. It's, yeah. it's 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 not. It's it's you. You have to know the risk going in uh, mm-hmm. that you may get a absolute turd of a car. Oh jeez. You might. Uh, I got fortunate where um, even the issues that were pointed out on the auction sheet, which mm-hmm. kind of did lower the grade and the value, yeah. actually weren't really problems at all. Like oh, they really? had talked about um, the the leather inside on the shift boots were all torn to shreds, and the steering yeah. wheel was bad. But it was an aftermarket steering wheel. It was oh, the, yeah. the boots were fifty bucks. I mean, like it, oh, it's it, not. Yeah, yeah. Fixing up the car and end up to, to making it a, into a, a, a very you know well maintained vehicle was was not bad at all. Yeah. Um, but you know the auction sheet kind of said otherwise, and I just kind of made the call with well, it's cheap enough to where I could over time build it up. Yeah. And it just so happened that I got lucky. Um, but anyway, so you you, you got to get a company that that can. I can um, make the auction purchase for you. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, gave they they purchased it and, and was able to coordinate with a couple of transport places to find it into a or get get it over to um, the shipping yard through yeah. you know 
then you'd have to book um, shipping transport through a a transport company. We actually really? used um, oh my gosh, I can't remember the name of the company. Um, I think it was Ford. It, they're basically, they're big big time um, automotive transports. Like so, they they my car was on the same cars as our Toyotas that were built in Japan. Or, oh really? Oh, okay, or cool. you know, throughout the the European manufacturers. That's gonna be one of my other big questions because I've had friends try to import stuff, and you you hear sometimes you have to rent a whole crate or some because of how special a car is. Sometimes you get there's like there, a lot of different ways you can do it. There are lots of different ways. So I, what I, the way I did it was kind of a little bit more of the um, it was a little more expensive. Well, I don't know if it's more expensive to be honest, but it was more. Um, uh, the common or the, the more common way for an automotive. It's, they call it a roll on, roll off. Oh yeah. I think it's, yeah. So that car was driven onto the boat and it was yep. driven off the boat. The, yeah. You can do it crates, but you kind of, those tend to be a little scarier, um, really? you know, because you have to have someone load up the crate, then transport the crate and then get uh, the crate onto the boat. And hopefully if you're, if you're not doing it yourself, yeah. Um, you know, if you're not going to Japan and physically doing all of these arrangements, yeah. you kind of have to trust the people yeah. that you work with that are going to do that thing. Well, the only thing I had to trust was a guy driving my car onto the boat. <laughs> That's a good point. Uh, That's funny. Is yeah. part of me thought it might be safer to do the crate because natural elements of you know whatever happens at, uh, out in nature. But oh well, these boats are designed to carry cars, brand new cars. So oh, really? they're covered. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's, you go inside okay. the hole of the, of the boat. You're not on top of it. It's yeah. not like a like a like a shipping crate uh, yeah. boat where they have them on top of the deck. Your car's not on top of a deck. It's not like that. Oh, okay. And then out of curiosity, how's the things? How do things work with the, like the licensing and the title? Because I, I remember reading a couple years back in Japan, they actually they weld the license plates onto some cars, and it's permanent per the car. Uh, well, you don't have to change the license plate after 25 year old. Oh, you don't have to worry about it. All. Oh, you're talking about the license plate or, or the, the VIN title. Plate? Or the, 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 Sorry, you're talking about the VIN plate or the yeah the VIN plate and the title or yeah. is there like a piece of paper title from Japan that you get too or you get a deregistration paper so basically oh, okay. you you deregister the vehicle they will they will take the plates from the vehicle so if it's a welded on plate like Just, the like the actual tags the yeah. front and rear tags if you get that then you're not going you're not getting those back or you're they're yeah. gonna have to you have to get a repair guy to unweld them or yeah. cut them off <laughs> uh, but you'll get a deregistration paper um, in a couple of forms uh, that the whatever the local prefecture has to deregister that they'll get those. You need to get them translated. You have to have them translated. Oh, really? Um, How, by a third party or do they have people at the dealership or what, what was that process like? It's, it depends. It, it can be a third party. It could be someone uh, on the U S side. It could be someone on the Japan side. It depends on where you end up. Um, it, it, it should, they should be translated. Yeah. And, and that's, that's, a, that's about it. Um, Cause the U S customs portion of it, the title work, the, the, your state, government mm -hmm. won't accept an untranslated document. They don't oh, know what okay. it says. They're not yeah, going to accept it. So <laughs> however you get it done is, is, it's up to you. I, I think I, I utilized um, some friends that I had at Toyota oh, really? uh, who, you know, do that stuff all the time. They oh, were just cool. like, yeah, I'll translate it. So that's how I got mine translated. Um, so anyway, the, uh, once you get the registration papers, you, you know, get the transport truck or the transport ship, someone rolls it on for you or you, you could, you know, I don't think you can actually drive it on yourself, but someone at the, at the shipping yard who's, um, you know, got the clearance to do so will drive yeah. it on and, and, um, you know, you can, you can, I think you can witness it. I know you can witness it coming off, uh, if you're escorted by a certain personnel, which you have to hire. Really? <laughs> yeah. So once it gets to the port, um, it's your responsibility to pick it up. You know they'll they'll drop it off into a yard, yeah. um, usually surrounded by a bunch of other cars. It could be other other commodities, but if it's a car transport, the the, the shipping yards they go to are generally going to be car related. Yeah, and so you go into. I remember I think I got it out of a Freeport in, near Houston. Um, is where they dropped off mine, and and I drove down there with the trailer because again I don't know the condition. Oh yeah, of course. Car. I don't it might, it might not run. Yeah. yeah, it may not. I don't <laughs> know. So we get down over there, and, and uh, uh, you go into this little shed, and, and you give them the transport papers that the shipping company gave you. And in parallel, you're working with a customs agent, or you don't have to work with a customs agent, yeah. or um, I'm sorry, a customs broker. Mm -hmm. You can do this paperwork yourself, yeah. um, but you have to be careful because you have to dot every I. Yeah, and you make one mistake. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so to me, it was worth it to pay a little oh, bit yeah. extra, especially the first time doing it myself, uh, to get someone to help me out with it. But... I worked very closely with um, uh, this company that that you know does this for other cars, not Skyline, it's not just just in general they do it for a bunch of cars. Yeah. Um, and uh, uh, so yeah, they, they had the paperwork prepped for me. I got the packet, I brought it down to the to the. It was a little shed. Yeah. <laughs> it, was a, 
and it was in the middle of COVID too. So you had have all these these people with the crazy protocols of not oh, going yeah. in the office, and there's <laughs> hundreds of people you know, out the line. It was just crazy. Oh gosh. And um, you know, they uh, gave him my favorite work. They pointed out to where the car was in the field, and you know, I was like, I already know where it is. I can see it a mile away. It's right here. Oh yeah. And so I'm looking at the car, and, and uh, you know, I had to go, and, and and it wouldn't start. Oh no. Uh, really? The battery was dead. Oh, okay. Um, but it oh, wouldn't geez. start. Um, but I, they weren't going to jump it for me. What? Yeah, they were like, well, do you want us to, like, push it or crane it? Like, what? And, I, I, and basically, they were saying that I had to go fix it for them to move it. Or they were just going to, like, shove it out of the way. But they don't yeah. care. They don't care. Jeez. And so, uh, in order for me to go over to across that fence, there was a fenced area, I had yeah. to essentially hire... Um, I forget the the certification, but it was a as someone who's allowed to be in a, in a custom style area. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. And so basically, they had a badge. They were an escort. Yeah. Fortunately, there was a guy on there. It was literally like two rows over. He didn't charge me. He was just like, "I'll just yeah. take you over. It's no big deal." But nice. for anyone who's trying to do this themselves, yeah. be prepared you to give someone more. 100 and yeah. 300 bucks to do that because that's that's usually what you need to do on on, on some ports. Yeah. Of course, as my experience has a little bit of a different variances than others. You know, right. like for instance. Um, Local law, state local laws. Mm-hmm. Once I got the car, drove over to customs, got a stamp on the on the customs uh, sheet yeah. from a customs office. I took that up to the to the local DMV, mm-hmm. and they gave me my tags. Actually, they wanted a bill of sale or a, a um, like a receipt record of yeah. how much I paid for it, yeah. and they wouldn't accept. Uh, what would, what would they know? They wouldn't accept the the auction sheet. I had to actually show that I paid it, not what? that I not the value. That the auction sheet said they wanted it to, so I had to get, um, I had to get it translated. I had to get the wire transfer translated because it's all in Japanese. Oh, geez. And then permitted it to show it. But I don't know if that was a normal practice. Yeah. I, no one, nowhere did it say that I needed that stuff. Yeah. So just be mindful that you may want to, you know, find out who needs what beforehand. Because even yeah. when I asked them what all I needed, that was never part of it. Of course. Yeah. Um, and so there's always going to be some surprises, but. You know, it wasn't a big deal. I just got it translated. Went back the next day, and, and they gave me my, my tags and everything, and, and I was done. I was done. I got it inspected and, and was good to go. And um, it's very, very simple. But California, on the other hand, uh-uh. you can't do that. Uh, <laughs> really? Yeah, there's yeah. there is still um, modifications, I think, to be, need to be made. And, and, and someone I'd recommend uh, looking towards, and this is not an advertisement, but okay. someone I know is, is, is very good at doing this, they've been doing it a long time, is that top rank. I know Sean Morris, yeah. uh, who's big in the Skyline community, um, uh, basically was around during the Motor X days, which was mm-hmm. The cause of the whole. I was going to say that that's the big, the big story everyone yeah, knows yeah, about. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, he was a big part of that. Uh, I don't know his full role in it, but he he was he was in that in that era. And you know now um, he owns a or not owns. He's part of a a import company that that caters to California. And there's a lot of work that they do, and, and they, they from my understanding they do a really good job. I've never done any business with them, but I've talked to Sean several right. times. Um, he seems to know what he's doing, and 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 seems to 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 have that quality mindset to make sure that everything is dotted and, and crossed. So yeah. he's also pretty good about a resource of reaching out to and, and answering questions. So if you have a question about California, go ask him because there's too much he for knows. me to remember. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, out here, so out of the whole importation process, what was the most difficult part? The waiting. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah of course. <laughs> the waiting, the finding of a car. Um, you know, the first the first time around, it was a it was a full year before I actually got the car. But really? Yeah, there's a lot of lot of stuff that just it wasn't it was crazy. It was crazy working with someone who did who you know back in the day was doing these import stuff. Me would be shady or not. Mm-hmm. Um, there was a lot of a lot of worry that that happened going away. And this time, uh, doing it myself, it probably still took four or five months. I think. Oh wow. Yeah, and and that's after paying for everything. You know? Yeah. So you're. Jeez. You know, trying to make sure everything goes through because you got the investment now. Yeah. And uh, um, I think the hardest part was is literally the waiting. I mean, the paperwork, the research side of it, you know, it's all available. Oh, it's, yeah. n- it's not hidden. It's, yeah. not, it's not a secret. I know people tend to think that it's, it's you know, they're always asking these different questions, but it's yeah. really all out there. Yeah. There's nothing that blocks you from searching. Go to the, go- the dot .govs of yeah. NHTSA and, and, and uh, EPA. The, I think, I think it's H17 is one of the forms and mm-hmm. you know there's 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 three forms you need essentially yeah um and then the rest of it is the process through through the custom side if you have a broker they, they do most of that paperwork for you you still got to fill out your side and then and then they just they file it basically to the correct people yeah know? and all of that stuff can be found online 
you know, doing it, knowing now I could probably easily go back and do everything myself oh, and yeah. not hire anyone. Um, but, you know, just it really is just a Google search away um, when it comes to that stuff. So the difficulty isn't in the actual importation. It's really? finding a car that yeah. you're comfortable spending quite a bit of money on. Oh, yeah. Hoping that it gets to you. Trusting these people yeah. that are being paid to do something that you've never met yeah. if you're not over there. Of course. Um, and, and waiting for the car to arrive and hoping that you made a good investment. I mean, that's literally the hardest part. So it's like every day, that feeling of like waiting under the Christmas tree, Christmas Eve, like, is my toy going to be there? Is it going to be here? Oh, yeah. When, yeah. Will I get this light piece, when, when will I get this piece of legendary automotive history? And the worst part about it is, is when you're tracking, because they have tracking uh, now for these ships, the, yeah. the car carriers. Uh, you can track it on the on its route. Mm. But they're not very good. Oh, really? So like you... <laughs> I was tracking it up to where it left the port. Mm. And then across the ocean, I had no idea where it was. Oh, so the entire time, <laughs> I had no idea where it was until it actually made it to the coast oh my on this side. And then it started tracking again. So I'm just like, oh, gosh. I know I have a tracking tool. I'm yeah. checking it hourly almost. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> getting no updates for, uh, I think it was a month or two. Yeah. Somewhere around there. And just oh my gosh. hoping that, it's, that it shows up on the other side at some point. So. I, yeah. I would be checking the news every single day. Did the ship go yeah. down? Did it p- disappear? Yeah. Where is it? Because it's not on my app, or I, I can't, I can't see where it's being tracked. Yeah, and, and the <laughs> other hard part I, I will say is not buying parts for a car you don't have yet. <laughs> yeah, I kind of at least in my one of my other questions is, what's it like trying to maintain and modify this car? Uh, well, having the background that I have, yeah, oh, it helps. <laughs> it helps a lot. Yeah. Um, I, I don't have to trust other shops to do anything. Um, I don't have to trust, uh, you know, somebody who claims to know things about these cars because you know everyone wants a piece of these yeah. of, of the JDM cars. It's not just it's not just Skylines. It's yeah. you know people think they know everything about the RX sevens. Oh yeah, um, and there are a lot of good shops out there. There really, really are. Don't don't think I'm not putting anyone down. But I have I haven't had um, I've had good good experiences on certain shops. Yeah, and I've had really really bad experiences with others. What was the worst? Huh? What was the worst experience? Uh, probably one of the shops that kind of, you know, had, had, I, I had a vision for my first GTS mm-hmm. um, uh, that was more or less going to be a unique build. I didn't really care about high horsepower at the time, but yeah. they kind of pushed my vision into what they wanted it for their own profits. They wanted to build kits for the car that they oh, could sell. And yeah. so they used my car as kind of a, a prototyping bench, which I was okay with because I got a lot of discounted parts and stuff. Okay, but that helps. when I finally got my car back, um, you know, the communication between what was actually done to the car and what I was to be paid was completely wrong. Oh, jeez. Um, and so it ended up being, um, I'd probably say 300% more than what we agreed to and ended up, you know, having to fight that. And then jeez. on top of that, when I actually got my car back, um, there were several things wrong. Um, they broke my AC system. What? They didn't Hook. They didn't put my bolts back into my transmission. Um, uh, they didn't put fluid they back left, into my trans. They, they left bolts out? Yeah. What? Yeah, I think I had two bolts actually torqued down on my transmission. And this is now a 700-horsepower beast that, oh you know, gosh. is only being held on by two bolts on the bell housing, which luckily nothing happened. Yeah, um, thankfully. But, uh, you know, the, well, the reason why nothing happened was because they didn't put fluid back into the transmission when uh, they had to replace the clutch in it at some point. Oh, jeez. Um, you can't make, a, you can't so make this the trans, the trans broke before it had an opportunity to break, if oh, that gosh. makes sense. Yeah. So things like that. And this was this was many, many, many years ago. And, yeah. and um, uh, you know, I, I've used a, a shop or two recently because um, now I'm starting to get into more tuning myself. And, yeah. and uh, I had a shop help recently that that I think did, did a good job. Um, there were some bugs in, in, the, in, the, in the software that, yeah. uh, fortunately... The shop has been working with me, you know, without without fail. Awesome. Um, has done a lot to to make sure that you know the outcome is great. And so, you know, even still, I guess to answer your your question, it's it it can be difficult to get parts. Yeah. They're, they're rare. They don't exist. You have to get aftermarket. Yeah. I don't like aftermarket so much anymore. Working for an OE, I see the quality that yep. goes into OE versus what they see in an aftermarket. Oh yeah. And so I'll always choose an OE part where where possible, and that's not always possible. Yeah, you know, if I need something to be upgraded, or if I need something to be more robust, or just exist, I sometimes have to go the aftermarket route or custom fabrication. 
do you um, do you ever import parts from Japan or, or is, it, is there an eBay of Japan oh, that you well, or? there is an eBay of Japan. There's there's Crew Bar, there's uh, Yahoo Japan auctions, there's Yahoo. Uh, yeah, really. Yahoo, All right. Yahoo auctions. Yeah. In Japan. <laughs> Um, there's, there's, uh, companies that, that cater to importing parts into the U S like right hand drive, Japan, RHD Japan. Oh yeah. Um, diff- all diff- different places you can get, you can get car parts for It's not, it's with the internet. It's not so bad when I oh, had yeah. my first one, which was, oh yeah. 10 or 12 years ago, it was a little harder, but nowadays, oh yeah. Not hard at all. Awesome. Yeah. I was gonna say, can't wait to see you in the car, the track next time. Yeah. I actually <laughs> need to, uh, Fix my rear diff. <laughs> oh, there you go. <laughs> and then I'll be in. Hopefully, I'll be in a, on on track in March. So I hope to see you out there. Oh man. yeah, you're gonna be yeah. Eagle Canyon. Or is that? Uh, I th- it's I either it's either Motorsport Ranch or Eagles Canyon. I, I don't remember. I, it's I've one got of the a, two. Yeah, yeah. And, and I plan to to go to as many as I can. If I can get the car done before February, I'll be in February. But yeah. I think it looks like right now it'll be it'll be March. And and I heck at this point I may just go out to the next one in February anyway, even though the car's broke, because it's an open yeah. diff instead of oh, yeah. So it's, I mean, if I break it more, I, I'm replacing it anyway. Yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> so I'll end up, uh, hopefully I'll get to, uh, I'll see you out there I one can. of these times. And, and uh, uh, cause I, I've been watching you, man. Yeah. I've been watching you. And, <laughs> and I remember when we started out, you know, um, <laughs> I remember following you at, at MSR. I was right behind you uh, coming around. I think it was boot Hill. Oh yeah. And, um, and you're, you're coming around that corner and, and, and you had, you were coming around and you were, you were correcting a little bit and, and it was, I was waiting for that pass by and I was like, oh yeah. man, you know, there, there's top and he's getting after, he's getting after it. And then trying get, to, what's that? Trying to, <laughs> trying to. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean the, 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 how much power are you having? Oh, it's only 205, maybe, 205? maybe 207, yeah. but Weighs with the cold like air. Yeah. 30, yeah. 3,000 somewhere. Yeah. 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 Anyway, it, you were doing phenomenal. You're doing yeah, phenomenal. I appreciate it. And, uh, and I'm sitting there watching like, all right, you know, is, is, if I, I, I know I'm right there cause I got a little yeah. more power than you. And I'm like, waiting for that pass by, waiting for that pass by, you gave me the pass by and you gave it to me so late that I was, I was actually like afraid to make yeah. the make the pass and i was like no i'm gonna do it anyway so i went down and i, and I passed oh, yeah. you and, and you were following me and i was watching you uh keep keep you know cl- oh, yeah. keep close eye and it was just a lot of fun it's it was a lot of fun so uh now i've seen you on on the track man you're just absolutely we, we were both <laughs> learning and yeah. now dude you're killing it man you're i appreciate it, it. I, yeah i was really proud really nervous and proud when i got promoted from hpte one to two where you start driving on the track without an instructor very nice yeah, yeah solo was, now huh yeah i was really nervous very but cool. i you know quick, took it slower than usual for the first couple laps but Finally, you know, once the rust is shaking off, you a little more confident. So I think it's getting to the point where we're going to start actually timing the laps now that I got, I've been reading the, I got read, read a couple of books by Ross Bentley that PJ recommended. Yep. And Ross Bentley's great. Yeah. It's just, yep. um, now I'm finally starting to get into it. So I'm really excited. And yeah, seeing your car passing on track with it, fireball coming out of the exhaust. <laughs> it, it is the legend. That picture on fa- Facebook is legendary. I love oh, it. Thank you, man. Well, I'll tell you what. <laughs> Next time I see you out there, I've got a whole comm system now, multiple helmets, you know, all that kind of stuff. I love giving giving ride alongs. So why don't I give you a ride along next time we're out there? Heck yeah, that'd be legendary. I appreciate yeah. it, man. Yeah, absolutely, man. Perfect. Thank absolutely. you so much for the podcast. Can't wait to race soon. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Thanks for having me. me. Thank you everyone for listening. Topping Talks again is also on YouTube, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, and Stitcher. Don't forget to subscribe, like, comment, tell your family, tell your friends, tell your coworkers, tell your enemies. Heck, tell anyone. Just stay safe. Y'all have a great day. Talks.